Morning New Life CNY. It is wonderful to be here today to gather together through the wonder of technology. We are here for Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is a wonderful time for us to raise our voices and praise to our Heavenly Father, and that is exactly what we're going to do today. We're also going to be celebrating communion at the end of service. This is our unplugged service, so we hope that you will be able to just take some time and be in reflection of all the praises, of all the blessings that we have. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we welcome you this morning. We welcome you into your house, that we are here, we are ready, and we are entering into a time of worship and praise, celebrating your son and his love that he sacrificed for us. We ask that you come. In your name we pray.
come today and to raise a hallelujah, to raise our praises to you, to know that wherever we are, you will hear them. Whether we are in your house or our house, whether we are on the street walking or whether we are in the store getting supplies, our praises will be heard by you, Heavenly Father. We are so grateful for the opportunity to be able to not hold back and to be able to sing your praises to sing of the love of your son and his sacrifice. We ask that you continue to move this morning, that you are with Pastor Chris as he comes up and shares your word, that you give him the direction he is supposed to go in. We ask this in your name. Amen. put the job out to get a bunch of prices and things like that. And uh, someone said to me, hey, there's an Amish community about an hour from here. You might want to check out their prices. So, of course, I couldn't call them on the phone, so I had to drive up to this community. Um, and there was such a whole community, really, a whole group of people who were um, Amish, uh, I guess, by faith and, uh, and uh, ethnicity. Uh, but they all had different kinds of trades. And one of them had a huge uh, metal break that made metal roofing. So I went in and I talked to the fella. It was really cool. His name was Mose, which reminded me of the show The Office, and the guy running by the side of the car. And I thought that was kind of cool. And I was talking to him. I got a bid for the job. It was a large roof, um, and it was roughly about 50% cheaper uh, than the original uh, quotes I had. So I said, okay, great, let's do this. And he said, great, uh, we'll have it done in a week. And uh, he shook my hand and I said, okay, I'll be back in a week. So we went by, I drove up with the big industrial trailer, parked it, he said, I'll have my kids loaded up for you. And inside this facility, there were a whole group of little kids. I mean, from five years old to you know, 18 years old, none of them wore shoes. Uh, it was in October. And they started loading up all this metal on this trailer I had. And I said to Bose, okay, how do I pay you? And he said, just go right inside, my son's in there, and um, he'll take your payment. So I walked inside this barn, uh, no shoes, kid had no shoes on, and he's standing there. He was eating a cantaloupe while he was talking to me, and it was all covered in flies, and it just didn't bother him and freaked me out. So anyway, so I had a, I had a pocket full of cash. I had $17,000 in cash. And here's this kid sitting on a, on a stool behind this little table, and I'm about to give him $17,000 in cash. And I am start counting up money, and he's looking at me kind of weird. He just kind of trusted in the handshake. And I looked at him and he looked so young. I said, how old are you? And he said, 14. And I'm like, okay, I'm giving $17,000 cash to a 14 year old kid who's eating a cantaloupe and not wearing any shoes. So I went out there, I said to Mose, he's got the money. He's like, okay, great. Off I went with my, my roofing. I got to the job site and backed it up and I looked at my watch. I said, oh my goodness, I need to go to my son's hockey practice. Things were running late, so I got in a car, I drove as fast as I could, grabbed my son, he was real, real, real young at the time, drove to the ice rink, got all the skates tied on, I was coaching, got out on the ice, running a practice, running here, running there. Then we, after the practice, we had a big meeting about where we're gonna go play hockey over the next weekend and everything like that. And I just started to think, wait a minute, am I, am I crazy? Their kids are making the money. Those kids are working. I said, am I insane or are they neglectful? And I started to think, how does this work? Am I, are they too strict or am I too lenient? Are their kids workers and my kids worshiped? And I started to think about who's right, who's wrong here? And then I started to think, how does God look at us as parents, as a parent? How does he look at us as children? Are we workers? that we produce and make him money, or we produce things for him, or are we worshiped? Are we things that just kind of be, is our relationship with God about doing, 
or is it about being? Are we worshipers of God or are we workers of God? How does this dynamic play out in our faith, in our relationship with God? Is God a neglectful God where he just says, oh, go do whatever you want, it doesn't matter? Or is he abusive God? He says, you do exactly what I tell you to do and if you don't, you're going to be punished. How does God look at us as a father, as a parent, as a God? And how do we relate back to God? Is our relationship about doing? Is it about being? Is it about being a worshiper? Or is it about being a worker? This has been a conundrum. This has been a problem for the Christian faith since its inception. This is a problem with the church today, is trying to figure out how we relate these two aspects of our relationship with God together. And this morning, I'm going to figure it all out. No, this morning, I'm going to talk about this with you and walk around this with you, kind of kick at it, and give you a lot of things to think about. So here's the passage we're going to look at today. It's Psalm 98. We're going to read the whole psalm in this incredible voice of mine. And I'm um, going to take it real slow. And we have served, we have uh, communion afterwards, which will be interesting in this voice. It's going to be like communion served by John Wayne or something. But okay, Psalm 98, verses 1 through 9. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, and bring forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre and with a lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets, and the sound of a horn make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it and the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. So first thing we're looking at here. And if you're following along the new version, these are the fill in the blanks. The first is the compact or the guarantee or what God really promises us. And it's really interesting that this psalm here is talking about judgment, but it is also talking about worship. It's talking about judgment, God coming back to the earth to judge it. And then it's talking about joy and peace and equity. Now, Saturday nights, there's a program on, usually one of the stations, it's usually a murder mystery program, a news program, Nightline or Dateline or one of those programs. And usually about three quarters of the way through it, I say to my wife, I'm going to bed. And there's just something about the night before you go to preach, seeing about a murder, it just doesn't, it's not helpful. So I say, I'm gonna go to bed. So my wife goes, I gotta stay down here and see what, what the verdict is. Now it's really weird. Here is a, is, is a psalm that's saying, judgment is coming, and there's joy. Here comes the judge, and there is this whole idea of joy to the point where the rivers of the earth are going to clap when God comes back to judge the earth. Nobody likes to see judgment come. When judgment comes, it's final. When judgment comes, there comes authority, there becomes mystery. Judges can do what they want in a lot of situations. And here's a situation where it's saying judgment is coming and this is an awesome thing. Usually when a judge enters a room or a, a jury comes back with a verdict, everybody gets quiet. Matter of fact, the defense, everybody needs to stand and hear the judgment that is being read. It is very serious, it is very somber. This is the exact opposite. It is saying, judgment is coming, hooray. Why? It's because there's this idea 
that there is a king coming back who's good, who's equitable. And you see, we, we as, as Westerners, as Americans, have trouble with this. We don't fully understand the concept of a king. We live in this idea, we live in this idea of a, a, of a democracy. And democracies, they're, 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 they're this interesting thing. They're, they're kind of preventative medicine. Churchill said democracy is, is the worst form of government except all the others. Democracies are, are, are incredibly, unbelievably inefficient. They're designed to protect us from killing ourselves. Now, when I was a kid, we, we used to summer, we used to have summertime at the Jersey Shore, my folks had a place down there, we'd go to the boardwalk, and I remember my parents one time took us and they used to have this go-kart track, and it was actually on an incline. And you'd get in these go-karts and my parents would begrudgingly pay a few bucks for my brothers and I'd trade, we'd drive these little go-karts around and it, one of the kids in our neighborhood had a go-kart and we realized how fast these things could go. And I remember we got on this track, we got on these go-karts and we floored it and those go-karts would barely move. So we went around it and I was like, man, these things are slow. And we got out and my oldest brother, I said to my oldest brother, Tom, I'm like, why are these things so slow? He says, oh, they have a governor on them. I'm like, they got a governor on him. He says, yeah, there's this little thing on the motor, prevents the motor from going full throttle. He says, so what happens is, it prevents it from going really fast, prevents it from going really, um, going from us killing ourselves. It prevents it from being really fun. And it makes this really cool ride boring. That's what a democracy kind of does. There's a balance in government and it prevents us. It's incredibly inefficient. And by the way, it's incredibly boring. That's why they say the two worst things, you, you, the things you never want to see made are sausage and law. It's not fun. It was really interesting. My brother figured out that there's a little ca uh, throttle cable on the side of the frame. And if you pull it, you get a boost of power. So the next time we went on it, we began pulling it. Next, we were passing everybody because we overrode the governor. Guess what? The ride became fun. Democracy is designed to be ineffective. It's designed to prevent us from killing ourselves. A few presidents ago, I'm not a political person, someone said to me, this president is going to ruin our country. I said, it's impossible. I said, what do you mean? I said, it's impossible for a president to ruin a country. It's designed to prevent that from happening. We think our president rides in on a stallion with, you know, with, with, with serving under divine fiat and all this Alon. He's, it's not that way. If you look at the State of the Union, these people stand up there, they go, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this, and you wanna know what he's gonna do, just watch when the whole room goes like this and claps. When half of the room does it and the other half does, what you realize he's just saying things. Nothing's gonna happen because that's the way he's designed. It's very, uh, uh, Ambrose in his book, uh, dealing with the whole idea of, of uh, World War II and how we entered World War II, what he says, uh, is, it's called Citizen Soldier, he says a, a democracy builds like a wave. It's very, very slow moving. It's very, very slow. And that's how we move as a democracy. And when we talk about this idea of a king, we just don't kind of get it. But there's something in us that wants that. There's something that's in us that wants this king to come back and do what's right. That's why I think we love superheroes and we love comic books. That's why there's all these movies about Captain America and all these things. The reality is if you gave someone that much power, they would ruin themselves because they would need to have the character and the power. And we, we, we don't understand that, but there's something in us that wants that. And what most theologians feel is that there's something of the fingerprint of God left in us from the original creation of Adam and Eve. That they were in a system where there was a God who was equitable. There was a king who was fair, who was not abusive, who was kind, who was loving. And there's something in us that longs to get back to that. And the promise is, is that that's what we're going to get back. Is that we have a God who is kind, who's fair, who's just, who's equitable, and he's going to come back, and he's gonna make this stuff right. It tells us that salvation, that it's yearning for God to come back, and when he comes back, salvation will respond with rivers clapping, it even says in another song, that, that, that uh, 
that trees will clap when God comes back. And that's the promise, that we have a God that's come back. But here's the problem. Here's the conundrum. This is your second fill in the blank. Is that we, we have difficulty with this. We have difficulty understanding how can we can be joyful when this God comes back? How can we be joyful when judgment comes? And we, 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 it's hard for us to get our, our, um, our, our brain around this today. Because if you talk to people outside of the church, and even if you talk to people inside the church, the most quoted verse um, that we hear today is in this whole idea of do not judge lest you are judged. And in a society that is, is dealing with this whole uh, idea, that's Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge or you shall be judged. And or the mantra of today, and that's the verse, so there's no judgment. So when you talk about judge coming, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we don't like that. And this is where socially and culturally we're like, we, we don't like this idea of judgment coming. And then the, the mantra of the culture is be true to yourself. Just be true to yourself. And then what the, the kind of the dogma is, is this idea is it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it with all your heart. And there's many problems that come with that. Because in a culture where everyone is right, everyone is wrong. In a world where you see everything, really what happens is you see nothing. So when we begin to talk about a God coming back with judgment, the last thing a society or a culture that believes that you be true to yourself and nobody is wrong is the, the one thing they don't want to hear is no, or you're wrong. Our culture today just doesn't understand this idea of right and wrong and judgment. And they don't, they don't want to hear it. People say to me all the time, I like that Jesus guy, but you know that part where he makes the cat nine tails and chases everybody? Ah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that part. You know, I like the Bible, but I don't like that. I like God, but I can't have a God that does this. In those situations, who is God? Who is the judge? You are. You are. If you can put parameters on God, you're God. And the last thing you want is someone coming in to judge. The last thing you want is judgment coming and telling you what is right and what is wrong. In a world where everything is right, nobody's right, and nobody's wrong. Here's your next one on the blank. Biblically, how do we look at this idea of this judgment coming? Is our covenant with God conditional or unconditional? So what does that mean? Well, you read verses like in, first, uh, in, in Judges 2, it says, I will never break my covenant with you. We go, Phew, that's awesome. God's going to love us no matter what. We can just go out and do whatever we want. Then we read Deuteronomy 20, 29, and it says, if you go your own way, God will blot you out. I don't like that. What do you mean if I go my own way? How far my own way? I sound like Kansas. How far is the point of no return? Where's the line where if I cross it? God blots me out. It's even in the New Testament. You go into Hebrews, you read chapter 6, and you hear about these people who were once through Christ, and they crucified them afresh, and they like they can never get back. And then you go right up into... Uh, verse 13, where, where it's quoted, I will never leave you or forsake you. Which one is it? Is God going to blot us out if we cross the line? Or is he never going to leave us or forsake us? What kind of relationship do we have with God? Does anything go and nothing matters? Or does everything matter? We need to obey or we're going to get nuked. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with this idea of judgment? Do we serve a neglectful father who says, do, do whatever you want? Or do we serve an abusive father who says, don't step out of line or I'm going to kill you? And this is the conundrum. Some folks will say in churches, hey, just give it your best shot and God will forgive you. And other people say, hey, God is merciful, but don't you go too far. We don't know where too far is, but don't you go too far or God is going to nuke you. God is going to blot you out. How do we deal with this conundrum? Is our God full of mercy and anything goes? Is our God a God of law? Is our God a God of law and you better not break it or you're done? Or is our God a God of love? Where anything goes, he'll never leave you or forsake you. 
This is the conundrum. This is the problem of the Christian faith. And what we see is we have people who go in one way, and we have people who go in the other way. This is the conundrum. What's the clarification? That's your next fill in the blank. Now, when we look at Psalm 98, it says, and all the earth, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. When you look at the first three verses, it's past tense. When you look at the, from verses four to nine, it's future tense. And what mo some theologians believe, and I'm stealing this from Tim Keller, is that the first uh, three verses are in uh, relationship to Miriam's song which is out of, out of Exodus 15. It sounds very much that way. And what you see is Miriam at that point is singing about a God who saved them from the Egyptians. God used judgment um, and he judges the Egyptians and he uh, uh, retains the, the Israelites. But he, in the final judgment, what God does is he saves the Israelites during a time of judgment. How? Firstborn, firstborn son of a family was going to die unless they took the lamb's blood and put it on the door, doorpost and the lintels of their house. Judgment came, but the blood covering their household protected them from the judgment. And Miriam is singing about this whole idea of God's salvation, of God's ability to bring judgment but spare them in the judgment. Now, it, uh, theologians often think that Luke chapter 1, Mary, Mary's song, the Magnificat, is also part of this psalm where she begins to sing about Jesus filling in this idea and merging the idea of judgment and love or law and love together. So we see these two songs, Miriam's song in Exodus and we see Mary's song in the Magnificent in Luke, where we're seeing what's happening is God is preserving the Israelites in judgment, and Jesus, through what he is doing at the cross, is absorbing the judgment that we all deserve. What we see in Jesus is this concept of law, you better obey, and love, I'll never leave you forsake you, coming together at the cross. It is this confluence of both law and love that come together that enable us as Christians to look at judgment totally different than anyone else. When we look at the judgment uh, that God is bringing to this world, we look at it through the cross of Jesus Christ. And what we say is, my judgment was paid for 2,000 years ago. That at the cross, Jesus took the judgment I deserved 2,000 years ago. John Stock puts it like this. He says, the essence of sin is putting yourself where God deserves to be. The essence of salvation is God putting himself where we deserve to be. The judge pronounces the fine, and in the gospel, he pays the, he, the, he pays the fine for us. The cross, what it does, is it takes law and love and puts them together. It takes the idea of judgment and lets us be reminded that God, through Jesus Christ, took what we deserve. We're next on the blank. At the cross, both love and law are satisfied. Both law and love are satisfied. Jesus fulfilled the law, which we could never do. Then he took the punishment that we deserve, that we could never sustain. And it came together for us at the cross. So when judgment comes, we don't joy over the fact that some people are not going to be part of that. Some people are not ready for it. We join the fact that our judgment took place 2,000 years ago. So when we look towards the judgment that comes to this earth, we realize that our God is coming back to make things right. Our God's coming back 
to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's coming here to restore the earth that's here and make it incredible to the way it once was. So when we think of this idea of judgment because of the cross, it becomes a place of joy and peace. That's why when we as Christians go into death, yes, it's scary. Yes, even this time where we're thinking about death probably more than anything, what we realize is that this world that we live in is just an hors d'oeuvre and heaven is the main course. If you love to be in the presence of God here, when God comes back and we see him, it's going to be even better. If you like the hors d'oeuvre, you'll love the main course. question is, what kind of God do you serve? You serve a God who's neglectful, does anything goes, do whatever you want. Or you serve a God who's abusive, says, don't you dare step out of line. I'll never bless you unless you do everything I tell you to do. The Christian God is where they come together, where law and love are fulfilled. And we obey because we've experienced the love of God in our life. We don't obey out of duty. We obey because we get to. We obey because we love to. What kind of God do you serve? Because in two seconds, we're gonna celebrate communion. And I think what God wants to do to us today is bring us into a relationship with him where our faith goes, become, goes from becoming a have to to a get to. From I better do this to I want to do this. To if I don't do this, bad things are going to happen. To I get to do this because I love my God, because he loved me. Let's pray and then let's have communion. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness, your mercy to us. Thank you that we serve a God who bore judgment for us. Thank you that we serve a God who finally clarify this conundrum of how you are. Lord, let us never swing way far off into those other areas, but realize, Lord, that you're not a God who's abusive. You're not a God who's neglectful. You're a God who loves us and took all of that judgment for us. So, Lord, when judgment comes to us, when death comes our way, which it will for all of us, we can enter into that mystery, into the unknowing, with an element of peace and joy. Let us experience you today in a new way as we celebrate communion. In Christ's name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. I'm just going to step down here. I'm at the communion table. I'm going to read the communion ritual to you. Um, a few folks came by, and we had communion and palms uh, available. We have self-contained communion here. Um, and as we go through the ritual, uh, please feel free to follow along with that. If you were not able to get to the church and get one of these today, uh, you can celebrate if you have elements at home. So the invitation goes out to you who, truly, who, who earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbor, and who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God, and walking in his holy ways, you are invited to draw near and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly coming before God, make your honest confession to him. I'd like to re recite the Lord's Prayer this morning. We'll use the terms debts and debtors. Um, if you're familiar with that, um, you can recite it at home. If not, listen. And as we conclude, um, you can say amen, which means I agree. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who gave and love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death, uh, death upon a cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all to provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world. We come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, 
who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he come again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly ask and grant that we, receiving this bread and this cup, as he commanded and in the memory of the passion of his death, may partake of his most blessed body and blood. The night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, we'll take this bread and we'll break it, symbolizing the body of Christ which was broken for us. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. If you'd like to take your communion, self-sealed communion, you can open up the top. Take out the wafer, the body of Christ, which was broken for us. Let's take together in unison. Now we can open up the second part. blood of Jesus Christ. Let's stay together in unison. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy to us. We thank you for at the cross both law and love came together. We thank you that you obeyed the law perfectly and that you laid down your, love, your life for each and every one. Us. Lord, we thank you that we can celebrate communion today. We just pray, Lord God, as we've embraced the sacrament, that your grace will flow to us in new ways. Challenge us this week to engage with you at new depths and new levels of our relationship with you. Let us realize that we don't serve a neglectful God and we don't serve an abusive God, but we serve a God of love and of peace and of joy. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said, Amen. Jess. He became sin.
want to bring to the church today. We also have different ways of being able to give your tithes and offerings. They were sent out in the newsletter. We have three different ways. You can give by PayPal or through Easy Tide, either through the online giving or through texting. There is a number there and you just text give. Very easy. Or you can drop it in the mail. Any of those ways you will be able to send in your tithes and offerings. And we hope that you have a wonderful week. We look forward to seeing you again live and reach out to us however you need. God bless.